All right, here we are again um, for part two. So, or for officially, this is le uh, lesson 10 in CNG 3306. Um, we're going to discuss generalized Hooke's Law. And the learning objectives for this, uh, we're going to use generalized Hooke's Law to convert state of strain to a state of stress. Um, and then you uh, look at the matter and use the mathematical relationships between um, modu modulus of elasticity, modulus of rupture, and Poisson's ratio. So let's do all that nonsense. Let's see. Hopefully, I won't need more slides, but if not, I can always create them. All right. So let us look at this. Now, consider a system like this. We're going to start with our um, our strains. So we're going to start with this. We're going to have um, epsilon x, epsilon y. and our shear strain. And this will be gamma xy over 2. And our two points for the circle, which we refer to as h and v, h being um, epsilon y, comma, gamma xy over 2, and v being epsilon x, comma, negative gamma xy over 2. So we could, from these, we could actually construct a Mohr's circle from uh, four strain. This is a similar idea. We could, we could easily construct a Mohr circle for strain. So maybe we would have, um, let me just draw the circle first. So we have a circle like this, a nice, perfect, perfectly round circle. Then we would have our, this, of course, we would actually form our circle from these two points. V and H, um, V being uh, epsilon X, comma, negative gamma XY over 2, and this being epsilon Y, comma, gamma XY over 2. And the circle is formed as the um, diameter between them. And then the center is just the average, um, average normal stress, or sorry, average normal strain, sorry. I'm all thinking about stress, I guess. When I see more circle, my brain just jumps directly to stress. For a lot of you, when you see anything in this class, your brain jump, jumps directly to stress, but a different kind of stress. Um, the peak here would be gamma max over two and this would be epsilon 1, and this would be epsilon 2, our principal strains, both our maximum and minimum normal strains. And let's see if I label the axes. Again, so on this axis, I would have uh, epsilon, normal strain, and on this axis, I would have gamma uh, over 2. Remember, we use gamma over 2, not gamma because gamma over 2 is analogous to um, is analogous to our uh, uh, shear stress. Now, just as a uh, just as a review, summing up from the previous lesson, um, we can have these equations: uh, the normal 
or the uh, strain for any plane n uh, can be thought of as epsilon x cosine squared theta n plus epsilon y uh, sine squared theta n plus gamma xy cosine theta n uh, sine theta n where n equals a, b, c, etc. So we start with that with our strain rosette. where n equals a, b, c, etc. Then the transform strains at any plane, the uh, epsilon x prime is going to be epsilon x plus epsilon y over 2 plus epsilon x minus epsilon y x minus epsilon y over 2 times the cosine of 2 theta plus gamma xy over 2 times the sine of 2 theta. And then if, if I look at my principal strains, epsilon 1, epsilon 2 are going to be epsilon x plus epsilon y over 2 plus or minus the square root of epsilon x minus epsilon y over 2 squared plus gamma xy over 2 squared. And this is going to be equal to epsilon average. And this is going to be equal to um, gamma max over 2. Or in the Mohr circle for strain, this corresponds to the center of the circle, this coordinate here. And this corresponds to the radius of the circle. OK, got that? Now, Hooke's law for axial loading. Let us consider Hooke's law for axial loading. So you've all heard of Hooke's, laws before, Hooke's law before. So consider the uh, thing we had in the previous lecture, where we have a sample of material that is being deformed via an axial load. So this is being the initial uh, shape is in black, and the deformed shape is in blue. And it is deforming under a load here, load P. And uh, it is becoming longer and thinner as it deforms. And of course, it becomes thinner due to a conservation of mass, conservation of volume, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And our axes, x is along the axis of um, along the axis of the member, along the central axis of stretching, and y is transverse to it. And for our stress here, our stress sigma x is simply going to be equal to p over a. Our stress is going to be equal to p over a. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to assume elastic loading for this. So in other words, uh, remember when we learned about the stress strain diagram before? The stress strain diagram before. Remember that fun stuff? Um, so we have epsilon x, epsilon y, 
Remember this uh, fun stress strain diagram? How it starts here, then it increases, and levels off, then goes up and goes to rupture, etc., etc. Well, um, for our purposes, we are going to assume we are in the elastic region. We are going to do our analysis assuming we're in the elastic region. If you find that your stresses are beyond the elastic stress, uh, beyond the say the elastic stress limit of the material, you will need to re to use a different analysis because this will no longer be valid. So we have our uh, modulus, modulus of elasticity in the x-direction. So we're going to assume we are in the elastic region. We are in the elastic region. So we don't have to worry about strain hardening. We don't have to worry about plastic deformation. We don't have to worry about all that nonsense. We're just going to assume that we are comfortably in the elastic region of the material. We have a uh, happy material, trees, happy trees. Just uh, thought I'd summon up the ghost of Bob Ross. Okay, so sigma x is going to be epsilon x ex, the uh, strain of the material times the modulus times the modulus of elasticity, and epsilon x is going to be equal to sigma x over ex. And the units cancel. And then um, we can apply Poisson's ratio, and we get that epsilon y is equal to negative Poisson's ratio Poisson's ratio in the x direction times the epsilon in the x direction, or which is also equal to um, negative Poisson's ratio. It's not a gamma, it's a Poisson's ratio, a nu. Uh, gamma x, I'm sorry, not gamma, Poisson's ratio, I keep saying gamma. Uh, sigma x over ex. and sigma y, then, um, again, we need a generalized Poisson, we need a generalized uh, Hooke's law. We need to be able to work with Hooke's law in any axis. So sigma y is going to be ey um, epsilon y, and epsilon y is going to be equal to sigma y over ey, and then finally, Epsilon x equals negative um, Poisson's ratio times epsilon y equals negative Poisson's ratio y times sigma y over ey. And we will use those going forward. Okay. Got all that nonsense? Okay, almost. So. Again, we need to apply, um, we wish to be able to work with loading in any axis, so we need to be able to apply this. Okay. So let's talk about biaxial loading. Elastic biaxial loading, bi meaning two, axial meaning axis. So we're talking about biaxial loading, loading in two directions. Biaxial loading. Superposition uh, elastic. Elastic superposition. What does superposition mean? Well, superposition means um, fundamentally, superposition means where you simply combine to strains, to loading conditions, etc., by simply summing up their them summing them up along their components. So you can you probably heard of the principle of linear super linear superposition, as it corresponds to um, say wave theory, where you have a variety of displacement. If you have a variety of waves being applied to a string, a vibrating string, for instance, where two waves meet each other, or on the surface of a uh, of a body of water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when you uh, when two waves intersect, they simply uh, linearly sum together. 
a negative displacement cancels out a positive displacement. Two positive two positive displacements um, add together. They they combine. They increase. So strains work the same way. It's the principle of superposition. The principle of superposition. So what we're going to have here is we are going to have a sample of material with stresses applied on two axes. So we, have, we, we are no longer having purely a, um, we no longer have purely a uh, CAL member, for instance. We are dealing with a member that is being loaded in two axes. So we have sigma x and sigma y being applied to the sample. So it's stretching in all directions, well, in two directions anyway. So how this would actually work, and now you may be surprised, to, uh, you, may, you may ask, hey, how does this happen? How can, didn't we just say earlier when something gets longer, it has to get thinner? Well, if we actually look at us, if we, if we were to consider a real three-dimensional object, the way volume would be conserved here is that if the, um, if I'm stretching this in the x and the y axis, in other words, if the dimensions are increasing the x and y axis, volume will be conserved by it getting much thinner in the z axis. Now, if I were to consider a three-dimensional case where I was simultaneously stretching it in the x, y, and z axis, well, the only way that could happen if the, is if the material was no longer maintaining constant density. It would have you had to be you would have to be applying a load in such a way that the uh, density of the material itself was actually decreasing. That's the only way it would work. Um, but we're not going to worry about such complex things here, so let's not worry about such horrid things. Let's save that for higher level classes. So let's look at 2D plane stress. For 2D plane stress, um, we have the following relationship that we've seen before, E equals 2, so in other words, the modulus, modulus of elasticity is equal to twice 1 plus Poisson's ratio um, times G, the modulus of rupture. Now, I'm going to need a couple of assumptions. I'm going to have a couple of assumptions behind these equations. It's always important to list your assumptions when you do any kind of analysis. Assumptions. Okay. The first one is I'm going to assume this is homogeneous. Homogeneous. The same material throughout. This isn't, say, a composite beam. There isn't a hollow space in the middle. It's just a, it's just a big lump of steel or a big piece of aluminum or a big piece of whatever. It is a it is a single consistent material. Same material throughout. Isotropic. So here we're saying that it's the same material throughout. Um, isotropic? No, isotropic. What does isotropic mean? Well, we can actually tease out the meaning just using some uh, knowledge of language. Iso meaning the same. You probably you, you may have heard in, in various uh, in various instances. You probably heard you probably you may have heard of the term called isos in industry or something like that. Iso meaning a standard. Iso means the same. Um, tropic. Well, tropic. What does tropic mean? Well, it means something to do with direction, right? It means something to do with orientation. Um, you, can, you can think of the uh, if geography, you can think of the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, things like that. These are, we're dealing with some sort of coordinate system or direction or something like that. So um, you can, a lot of these things, you can actually tease out the meaning if you know some Latin and Greek prefixes. Uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So this simply means same material properties in all directions. Same material properties in t all directions. So this is really a property of the object. This is a property of the material. And this isn't always the case. 
So this really comes down to the nature of the material, the nature of its crystalline structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if the, for example, you can have materials that uh, preferentially be, uh, that maybe you might have a material that say maybe if it was a cylinder like this or something like that or, or even a cube or something. Say if a non-isotropic material, if I apply if I applied a tension in the x direction, it may be able to withstand. If you say this was a cube of a non-isotropic material, maybe it can withstand a far greater load in the x direction than it could in the y direction. That is an example of a non-isotropic material. In other words, if the say the crystalline planes are all lined up along the x-axis, they can more affect. They can more. Um, Oh, let's see, they're, they're all lined up in such a way that um, maybe they can more effectively resist forces in the x direction. But then if I plot, try to pull in the y direction, the planes will just simply slip past each other. So um, now for a lot of our engineering materials, our good friendly metals like steel and aluminum are good materials, are nice friendly happy trees, that doesn't apply. But uh, there are certain materials that you actually do need to consider that. But it, let's just, but for our analysis here, we're not going to worry about such complexities. So in other words, what we mean here is that EY or EX is equal to EY. Poisson's ratio in the X is equal to Poisson's ratio in the Y. GX is equal to GY. All right. So some biaxial loading continued. Some equations of biaxial loading. Continued. So from this, if we do a lot of derivation, we can find that, um, let's see. I um, don't know if we'll work all the way through the derivation, but here you have it. Here's the result of it. Uh, epsilon x is equal to sigma x over epsilon x um, minus Poisson's ratio, Poisson's ratio times sigma y over ey. Epsilon y is equal to sigma y over uh, e. So I'm no, I'm no longer, I'm simply going to consider E here instead of, so, you know what, in fact, maybe I'll just say, I'll get rid of the um, EXs and EYs here, I'll just say E. Because again, this is isotropic, so I'm just going to use a single E, minus Poisson's ratio times sigma X over E. And epsilon z is equal to negative Poisson's ratio. That looks way too much like a gamma. Gamma over e times sigma x plus sigma y. Uh, that's it. Sigma x plus sigma y. Exactly. And this is going to be a, uh, we're going to use these later. I'm going to call this one, two, and three, like shown. So notice here, um, if we have plane strain, or, sorry, if we have plane stress, this is unequal to plane strain. So in other words, if you have 2D strain, or if, we, if you have 2D stress, this leads to three-dimensional strain. Notice, we're assuming a positive, we are, we're assuming positive stresses here. If in positive stresses, it's in tension. So notice what's happening. Our, um, our strains in the X and the Y can be positive, but the, um, but the Z is going to be negative. The Z, the, the thickness of the material, in the, it's, it's going to become thinner 
in the z-axis. And this all comes down to simple conservation of volume. As long as it's going to remain the same material, the same density, um, if something's got to give, if this thing is going to be increasing in the x and the y dimensions, something has to give. And what's going to give is if it's going to become thicker in the x and y directions, it has to become, become thinner in the z direction. There is no other option. As long as this is going to maintain the same density of material, there is no other option if we're going to have a concert, any kind of conservation of volume. Got that? Okay. Now, um, solving these together, we're going to get a generalized Hooke's law for 2D. So let's provide a little note here. Solving 1 and 2. leads to the generalized equation for Hooke's law in 2D. Okay. Generalized equation for Hooke's law 2D. And we're going to have this, so let me underline this. So sigma x is going to be equal to e over 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared times epsilon x plus Poisson's ratio times epsilon y. Sigma y is equal to uh, e over 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared times epsilon y um, plus Poisson's ratio again times epsilon x and tau xy is equal to g times gamma xy. And this is the generalized Hooke's law. And then if we solve these in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2, or solve, uh, yeah, like here, solve for sigma 1, sigma 2, in terms of uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, and tau max, So these are just the x, y, z's. But if I actually want to get, uh, if I want to get the uh, the, the principal stra stresses directly from any arbitrary uh, strains, actually from the principal strains, sorry. So this is the general st stresses from the general strains. If I want to get the principal stresses from the principal strains, then I'll have the following relationship: uh, sigma one is equal to e over 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared uh, times epsilon 1 plus Poisson's ratio um, times epsilon 2. Sigma 2 equals e over 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared times epsilon 2 plus Poisson's ratio times epsilon 1. And tau max is equal to g times gamma max. And there you have it. So I can give you a little flow chart here, aside here, a little note here. Let's say um, converting uh, strains to principal stresses. Two principal stresses. Okay, 
So we start with our strain rosette. Uh, st we start with our strain rosette. Uh, epsilon A, epsilon B, epsilon C. From this, we determine a determined state of strain, a state of strain, uh, EX, or sorry, epsilon X, epsilon Y, and gamma XY. Then we have two paths we can take. We can either um, more circle for strain. Let me try to squeeze this on here. More's circle for strain. Um, to get, uh, yeah, to get the principal, uh, let's say, sigma 1, sigma 2, um, yeah, let me think about that. Um, yeah, let me say, um, yeah, this should actually be, um, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, gamma xy, or gamma max over 2. gamma max over 2, um, or we can use um, generalized Hooke's law Hooke's law to get sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. Then we can th then we can apply general generalized Hooke's law to get uh, then we can apply generalized Hooke's law or here we can apply Moore's circle for stress and that looks just god awful writing Moore's circle for stress. And then this will lead us to our final answer, or final, uh, our final desired solution. Sigma one, sigma two, and tau max. Function. So we have two parallel paths. No matter what we do, we're going to go through one variant of Moore's circle, and we're going to need to apply generalized Hooke's law. We can choose which order we do it, but ultimately we are going to have to go through both steps. Okay, so let me work through an example. So that will finish out the lecture. This one might be a bit long, but that's okay. Okay, so I want to work through a full long form example. Isn't this lovely? So I'm given a whole bunch of nonsense, and I want to find some more nonsense. I'm given the following. And we have our old friends, Guyvin and Find. Guyvin. And Find, we are looking for sigma 1, sigma 2, and tau max. But we are, what we are given is the following, or given if you, if you prefer to pronounce it that way for some odd reason. Um, we are given that epsilon a is equal to 450 microstrain, epsilon b is equal to 100 microstrain,
and epsilon c is equal to 50 microstrain. And we want to find sigma 1, sigma 2, and tau max. In other words, we, we want to find the principal stresses and, and principal uh, strain. Oh, sorry, the principal stress, pr principal normal and shear stress. Solution. Um, we, we will find the thetas along the way, but um, that's not explicitly asked for. Oh, and also we uh, we're also told that we need, we need, we do need to know something about the materials. Poisson's ratio is equal to 0 0.32, and the modulus of elasticity is equal to uh, 29,000 ksi. For those of you who don't, if that number doesn't pop out at you, this is steel. Good, strong American steel. The good stuff. Good, strong American steel. The good stuff. Okay, so let me draw out these angles just for uh, just for a reminder how what this is going to look like. So we have here an x and a y axis and we have a strain rosette positioned to measure the strain on a few axes the first axis a is 45 degrees um, from the x axis so this was also part of the given and it will be critical um, b is 90 degrees from the x-axis and C is 150 degrees from the x-axis. So the so we have three measurements. Epsilon A is measuring the strain along axis A, epsilon B measuring the strain along axis B, etc. So let's look at a solution. Solution. Now, if we apply the following equation, I won't necessarily work all of the work out, but um, I'll just show what you would use. If we apply the equation epsilon n equals epsilon x cosine squared theta n plus epsilon y times the sine squared of theta n plus gamma xy times the cos the sine of theta n times the cosine of theta n. If you apply these, um, and just like we did in the previous uh, lecture, if you look at the in the previous portion of the lecture, uh, you would you would plug and chug. You would put you would put in the angles and the strains, and you would find the x y z or sorry, the x and y and the gamma xy. So work through all that, invert it, put it in a matrix, invert it, and you'll get that epsilon x is equal to 314 microstrain, epsilon y is equal to 100 microstrain, and gamma xy is equal to 486. Hey, what do you know? That looks familiar. It's like doing the same thing again. Uh, 486 micro radians and I believe in the previous portion of the lecture I might have said this was inches per inch actually it should say just be, be micro radians sorry about if there was any confusion there so the state of strain on a strain block not a stress block but a strain block would be like this we would have uh, positive strain positive happy strain uh, 486 micro and we would have normal strains as follows um, this would be 314 micro 
and this would be uh, 100 micro. So we've done that. We have the state. We have the overall strain. St the overall strain state. And now I'm going to apply um, generalized Hooke's law to find the um, to find the uh, state of stress. So using generalized Hooke's law. So in other words, the approach we're taking here is. Um, we get this. We're taking this right-hand approach. We start with generalized Hooke's law and use more circle for stress. But you can take either path. So using uh, generalized Hooke's law, Generalized Hooke's Law, that's after Captain Hook gets a promotion. Or is that the Admiral Hook? Never mind. I guess there's not uh, I guess there's not generals in the Navy, are there? Just admirals. Okay, never mind. My stupid joke is even stupider than before. Okay. So uh, Sigma X is going to be equal to E over one minus Poisson's ratio squared. Um, times epsilon x plus so just writing let me just write all this nonsense out Poisson's ratio times epsilon y I know my Poisson ratios look like gammas but they're not um, epsilon y or sorry sigma y I'm get, again I'm trying to solve for the state of stress e over 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared times epsilon y plus Poisson's ratio times epsilon x and ta xy is equal to g times gamma xy equals 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 I'm just writing out my equations before I use them plug and chug plug and chug plug and chug 29,000 ksi Over one minus uh, one minus um, point three two squared times three hundred and fourteen times ten to the negative six micro plus um, point three two uh, times one hundred times 10 to the negative 6. These are our micros. And I get for this 11.18 um, KSI tension. Here, this is 29,000 KSI over 1 minus 0 0.32 squared. Just plug and shut. Times, uh, let's see, now these are going to be switched. 100 times 10 to the negative 6 plus 0 0.32 times uh, 314 times 10 to the negative 6. And I get um, 6.48 KSI, also positive and in tension. Now, it is kind of uh, interesting to be aware of the, um, well, Okay, we're not going to say that. Okay, and then ta xy, plugging in, is going to be, uh, let's see, the g is going to be 11,000 ksi, found by applying um, Poisson's ratio, times 486 times 10 to the negative 6 equals 5.35 ksi. Neither tension or compression because it's shear stress. So now we have our generalized state of um, stress. So we have the state of stress at this point. We have x, we have y, and we have this here. 
So I'm going to have uh, in the x, I'm going to have the y, x, and y. Five point three five KSI and eleven point one eight KSI in the X, five point three five in the shear, and six point four zero in the Y. Now I can plot more circle if I want. Plot more circle. We're going to have sigma average equal sigma x plus sigma y over 2, which is equal to going to be equal to 8.83 ksi. So that would be the center of the circle. And then r would be equal to the square root of um, sigma x plus uh, minus, sorry. sigma x minus sigma y over 2 quantity squared plus ta xy and this equals 5.84 ksi so by plotting this we would end up with a um, we would end up with a um, a circle centered at 8.83 on the x-axis, 8.83 comma 0, of course, with a radius of 5.84. So we have our Fulmor circle. We can plot that very fairly easily. Um, and then I want to um, find the principal stresses. So principal stresses. Uh, principal stresses. Principal stresses uh, sigma one, sigma two, um, let's see, we're going to have sigma one equals sigma average plus R. Um, and sigma 2 is going to be sigma average minus r. Sigma average minus r. And 2 theta p. Okay. Um, so let me run through that. Is simply applying the correct equation, etc., etc. Um, so sigma 1 is 8.83 ksi. plus 5.84 KSI, and this comes to 14.67 KSI in tension, which will be in tension. That's a really crooked box. Um, sigma average minus R is going to be the same numbers, just a subtraction sign. 8.83 KSI minus 5.84 KSI which will equal uh, 2.99 KSI, also in tension. Then, um, let's see, 2 theta p, it's just going to be the inverse tangent of 5.35 over 2.35. Five point three five and two point three five should look hopefully familiar. Um, that's going to be sixty six point two nine degrees, or on the Mohr circle, theta p is going to be thirty three point one four degrees counterclockwise. Actually, not in Mohr circle. This is the physical one. Two theta p is on a, on the uh, Mohr circle. So if I draw the, the principal stress block, I'll have this, 
x, and then I have my rotated um, x prime y prime axis, x prime y prime axis. Uh, remember on the um, principal angles, uh, where you have principal normal stresses, you're going to have zero shear stress. So this is going to be an, at an angle of 33.14 degrees. And then we're going to have um, here and here and here and here. Sigma 1 equals 14.67. KSI and sigma 2 equals 2.99 KSI. Um, and then 2 theta s. And so now I want to get the max shear. Oh, did you get this? Okay. Um, max shear. The max shear, ta max. Uh, max shear tau max um, let's see tau max equals r equals 5.84 ksi and sigma average equals sigma 1, or sigma, sorry, x, plus sigma y over 2, which equals 8.83 ksi. And finally, 2 theta s is equal to 90 degrees um, minus 2 theta p, which, equals to t which is equal to 23.71 degrees, which corresponds to theta s equals 11.86 degrees uh, clockwise. Oh, so it's actually clockwise, not kind of clockwise. Clockwise. So drawing the uh, uh, stress block corresponding to the print to the maximum shear, if I have my x angle, I would uh, draw my x prime, let me show my x prime and y prime axis here. Ah, my x-axis went away. All of, I ruined everything forever. So I'm going to have my... Oh, I usually use green, but blue, why not? Y prime and X prime. And then I have my stress block. Here and here. Um, let's see here, 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 and here. I'm going to have, this is my V and my H coordinates on the Mohr circle. This is, and then I have my stresses all the same. My normal stresses are all the same for the max shear condition. This is, uh, well, this is going to be at an angle of 11.86 degrees. And this is 8.83 KSI. And this is 5.84 KSI. And then finally, um, so we have our theta s, we have our theta p, and we have everything. I could draw the Mohr circle, but it's fairly straightforward from there. All right, that will do it for today. Um, we'll be continuing on uh, tomorrow with more material. Um, be sure to keep up with the homework. I have now, at this point, uh, for well, for students watching this semester anyway, I have posted all of the homeworks for the remainder of the semester, so make sure you keep up with that. Um, we ha I will be sending out some notes on the exam. Um, if you have any questions, please email me, and that will do it. So uh, that will do it for today, and as always, thank you.